Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon Bible Study. Today will be study number 25 of Psalm 37. And we're going to begin by looking at verse 30. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. We've been uh, going through this psalm verse by verse, and we've seen how the Lord has constantly contrasted the righteous or the true believers, his elect, as well as also uh, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ with with that statement of being the righteous. He is the righteous one, and by his righteousness, many are made righteous, all of those that he came to save. And and so when the Bible says, the mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment, yes, it it is um, applicable to Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's also applicable to the people of Christ, to the true believers. The true believers also speak wisdom as we share the words of the Bible. The true believers also talk of judgment. Our tongue talks of judgment. Actually, here um, the Lord is, is saying this will be uh, the language of the true believers and judgment. We've discussed this. It is a word that identifies with all the Bible, but it also speaks of the wrath of God, the judgment of the law of God upon the sinner for transgressing the law. And and the, the true believer speaks of this as well as we speak of God's grace and love and mercy and goodness. Uh, we we want to speak of all the Bible, the whole counsel of God. We hold back on no point. Some people um, don't like hearing about judgment. And, and some say that uh, e-Bible fellowship spends too much time talking about God's judgment and and yet if anyone were to listen to our studies uh, well how do we go about it what is our process do we do topical studies each week we just pick a word like wrath okay this Sunday uh, or this day, we're going to just look at all the verses that speak of God's wrath. And then we look at judgment and anger and fury. Yes, you could spend a long time doing topical studies. and But we don't do it that way. We go verse by verse in the Bible. And the Bible verses themselves lead us into the discussion we have about them and and we've gone verse by verse through um first samuel for several chapters through the book of esther we've gone verse by verse now for the first few chapters of revelation we've gone verse by verse in isaiah chapter 24 and we've gone through the whole book of second john and third john and You'll find if you listen to these studies, and these are varied in different parts of the Bible. Revelation, well, you would expect there to be a lot of discussion of judgment. But what of Second John and Third John? They're short little epistles. And you'll find that the Bible directs us, no matter where we're reading, into a discussion of of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit directs us uh, to look at as we compare Scripture with Scripture. And so our tongue talketh of judgment. We, uh, we can only say what the Lord gives us to say. We, we should not say more and we should not say less. We have to say the words that the Bible speaks and 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 so as we do um, discuss them, it's a certainty that our tongue will then 
uh, speak of judgment. Okay, let's move on to the next verse, verse 31 of Psalm 37, which says the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. And again, this is a continuation from the previous verse. And and um, the uh, one or ones in view are the righteous. And the law of his God is is in his heart and again of course this is true a true statement of the lord jesus and it's a true statement of the child of god that is given a new heart and a new spirit the law of his god is in his heart the nature of the heart of the saved person is the law of God resides there. The, the Bible, the word of God is in his heart. It says in Ezekiel uh, chapter 36, as God focuses in on the uh, spiritual heart transplant that he performs, he says in verse 26 of Ezekiel chapter 36, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And here the we see, well, the law of his God is placed into the heart of the redeemed man or woman. God has given him a new heart and a new spirit, and the that heart desires to do the will of God um, in all of its points, to keep the whole law, and is given an ability to do it because there is no sin there is no error, there is no falling short of God's glory in the new spirit that he has placed within uh, someone that he has saved. Remember what 1 John chapter 3 tells us in verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, Christians mention all the time about being born again. And we understand, and so do most professed Christians understand correctly, that to be born again means you're saved. God has given you a new spirit. And, well, there God is telling us that in that spirit, The child of God, the newly born um, again sinner, will not sin in his heart. And, and, you know, um, there are other verses that also in 1 John that, uh, that say, well, if anyone says they're without sin, they're a liar. And and people read that and then and then they read this other statement and. And they get confused or or some don't fully uh, comprehend what God is saying and and they don't understand and they still speak of having sin in their heart. You'll hear someone from time to time who who thinks or believes they're a Christian and and they're uh, they're they're just uh, disgusted at themselves because they have sinned and. And so in uh, a moment where they're, they're just attempting to acknowledge their sin, they say, oh, if only the Lord would remove the sin from my heart. And yet they think they're saved. And you see, they don't realize that if they are saved, God has already removed all sin from their heart. He's given them a new heart, that old heart desperately wicked and deceitful above all things has been taken away and a new heart 
has been given them. Uh, but they they just committed something awful and ugly. And yes, that's true. But if they're truly a child of God, the sin did not originate in their soul, it, in their spirit essence, because that is new, born again, and perfect without sin. But they still have a body, a physical body. They're still in the flesh. And, and we don't know how it is that our soul and body operate. Um, we, we, especially a perfect soul, uh, join together with a corrupt, sinful body. But somehow in our members, in our physical body, we still commit sin, and and uh, and we do, and and yet it can uh, can seem well. H- how could that be possible if our soul is not committing sin? And we don't understand these things, but that is what is happening in the life of a true believer. The soul is perfect, pure, holy, sinless, and the body is is uh, the opposite of that it is tainted with sin contaminated and polluted and and that's why the body will die but the soul is born again it's an eternal soul the the soul existence will of the child of god will never die in fact if a true believer died today what would happen their body would go to the ground because it died as a result of sin, but the child of God's spirit would go to heaven to be with the Lord because there is no sin in it. It is ready and prepared to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so the the soul of that individual goes to be with the Lord and waits for the final day, the day of redemption of his body, And that's the day of salvation for the physical body, the resurrection of the body. He'll receive a new resurrected body, a spiritual body, the Bible calls it. And then he'll be one whole personality, again, uh, perfect in body and in soul. The, the, The second resurrection is the resurrection of the body. We have experienced the first resurrection of the soul. Well, here God is saying in um, this verse, Psalm 37, 31, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Since God has given us a new resurrected soul at the moment of salvation, which is without sin, as a result, we will walk perfectly in the word in our soul existence none of our steps will slide now you uh, that's true of the inward uh being the the inward circumstance of the one that has uh experienced god's grace but on the other hand you can you can also see that same individual who falls into sin. Just look at, for example, the biblical um, life of David. And, and what do we see? We see someone that God has saved, someone who has received that, that new heart, and yet someone who falls into sin with Bathsheba and commits adultery and then later has her husband killed uh, in in a battle and and so on david sins grievously sins and we would say well certainly his steps have have slid they uh, he's he's gone off course and and fallen o- o- off the path of of the right way that the bible s- establishes and god's law demands well, it's true. It's true of um, in one way, but when God here is speaking of the heart 
in that heart that he has granted the uh, redeemed individual is never going to slip. It will never backslide, uh, to, to use another expression that the Bible uses in, in that sense. So, so God says that it, his steps, uh, none of his steps shall slide. We read in Psalm 26, in verse 1, Judge me, O Jehovah, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in Jehovah. Therefore, I shall not slide. And you see here, I have walked in mine integrity. The Bible speaks of walking in the commandments, walking in truth. And that's what uh, the Lord has equipped uh, his people to do with salvation. It is as though spiritually we were all lame, unable to walk in the path of the word of God. But once the Lord has saved us, then we rise up spiritually and now we walk in, in the steps of Christ. We follow the path of the righteous. We walk in his commandments and, and we are able to do them in our soul through that new soul that God has given us and, and his indwelling spirit. Well, let's um, continue into verse 32, which says, The wicked watcheth, watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The wicked watches, watcheth the righteous and seeks to slay him or kill him. Uh, you know what's interesting about this? This um, this verse is the word watcheth. The word watcheth. The Hebrew word is Strong's number 6822. And it's the same Hebrew word that we find, for instance, in Ezekiel chapter 33 in uh, verses 6 and 7. And it says there, but if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. And uh, in these verses, the, in this passage, the Lord is uh, establishing his people in their post, their spiritual post of watching in the Bible. That's where they're to keep their watch. They're to continually look into the scriptures. This is why Jesus said many times in the Gospels, watch therefore, and, and especially in the context of the time of the end and and occasionally there would be a statement no man knows the day or hour the day or hour therefore watch because you do not know of course if you did know there'd be no need to keep a diligent search in the in the bible you you would just know but since you do not know watch therefore keep looking in the word of god and that was christ's command to his people Throughout the centuries, they were to just watch and wait on the Lord. Waiting for, well, as God said to Daniel, seal up the word, Daniel, till the time of the end. And then knowledge will increase. At the time of the end, God opens the scriptures and his people that have been watching in the, the Bible will then uh, increase knowledge concerning time and judgment concerning the times and seasons of God's plan for this world of salvation and judgment. And, and this is what watchmen are to do, what, what the true believer's task has been. It says in Micah chapter 7, Micah 7, 
in verse 7, Therefore I will look unto Jehovah, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Now the word look here is the same word, Hebrew word that's translated as watch. I will look unto Jehovah. You see, that's the uh, direction of the gaze of the one that serves God, of the true believer, the child of God. We look heaven, heavenward in a sense, but of course we're not looking into the sky. We're looking intensely into the word of God, the scripture, because that's where God speaks. That's where we're, uh, we're going to see God spiritually. And so we look unto Jehovah whenever we're looking into the Bible. You see, the, the believer, the true believer, is focused upon the word of God. And uh, we, we read, this really describes it very well in Habakkuk. In chapter 2, it says in verse 1 of chapter 2, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Here is, again, that spiritual task of being a watchman. Remember the watchman waits for the sword, and, and the sword identifies with the word of God. And when he sees the sword coming upon the land, he's to blow the trumpet and warn the people. And actually, the trumpet also identifies with the word of God. The watchman is upon his watch, it says here in Habakkuk 2, in verse 1, and will watch, what's he watching for? Is he looking for some signs in the sky? No. Uh, and we'll watch to see what he will say unto me. He's waiting for God to speak. And how does God speak once the Bible's been completed? How does God speak to us? He speaks exclusively only through the Bible in no other way. The, this is how God speaks. And God has also told us in Mark chapter 13, in the chapter which is dealing with the end of the world, the great tribulation and the coming of Christ. It, he says in Mark 13 and verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now, this is referring to the time of the end. And there is just no way possible that this could be referring to anything supernatural as far as divine revelations concern, because certainly at the time of the end, That'll be long after the Bible was completed back in the first century A.D. No, God is telling us, look, when you get to that point, when that hour of judgment, which identifies and relates to the Great Tribulation, the Bible refers to that as one hour. When that hour of judgment comes, then speak. Why speak? Because then you're to blow the trumpet, you're to warn the people, you're to share the information you receive from the Bible. But God goes on to say, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. And how is that possible then if it's not additional revelation? It's possible because when we compare spiritual with spiritual, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 explains to us the Holy Ghost teacheth and God is indicating at the time of the end I'll open up my word you'll just follow the same old familiar methodology 
uh, here a little, there a little, scripture with scripture, that my people have always followed. And as you faithfully do that, I'll be the one who opens your understanding to give you additional truth. And then speak it. Don't hold back. And when you do, I want them to know that I take full responsibility for it. It is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost that speaks. And and that's what Habakkuk is saying in Habakkuk 2, verse 1. He's standing upon his watch and will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what I shall answer, what I am reproved. And then verse 2, and Jehovah answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. That is, run the way of God's commandments. Once God opens these things up, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, he shall speak and not lie, though he tarry, wait for him because he will surely come. He will not tarry. You may have noticed I substituted the personal pronoun he rather than it, because that is how it should read. It is speaking of Christ. At the end, he shall speak, just as Mark 13 also told us that very same thing, and not lie, though he tarry, wait for him because he will surely come. He will not tarry, indicating God's plan at this time that we're very familiar with because we're living through the very days that he's speaking of. As it appears he has tarried because we had a date, you know, you it wouldn't be possible for Christ to tarry without an expectation of him coming on a particular time period and and that's what we had and uh, seemingly he has tarried but he has not tarried because he did come in judgment and he also will come in completion of this day of judgment to bring everything to a climax well now what's the point of all that What's the point of all that when we're looking at Psalm 37? And it says in in verse 32, The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. What does the task of God's people as being watchmen have to do with this verse? Well, the point is, and the reason why I went to those verses, is to uh, remind us and to show from the Bible that God's people are not looking at other people. They're not looking at other uh, professed Christians and, and trying to always correct them. God's people are not watching intently and closely what the cults are, are teaching. God's people do not set up a diligent watch upon the church is to see what they're teaching falsely. The Lord's people are not watching uh, individual pastors or preachers or or teachers of any kind, listening closely uh, to their every word. Uh, they've set up a watch uh, to um, find their fault, to listen to their mistakes and their errors and and their delusions. No, God's people do not watch in that direction. We don't look towards the uh, free will teachers or to those that speak in tongues or to those that have added to the word of God in whatever way they've done it or subtracted. We don't look at those that are very close to the truth, but off the mark. We were not fixated upon others that are teaching in order to prove them wrong. And now we see the difference. Now we see what the Lord is saying here by, and, and he's helping us to understand this through the use of this word watch. 
Notice where the watch of the wicked is. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. They're, they're not watching in the Bible. They're not watching to see what God will say unto them in his word. They're not looking into the scriptures, comparing spiritual with spiritual that the Holy Ghost might instruct them. They're watching, their post is, is all wrong. Their, their gaze is not heavenward into the Bible, into God's word. Their gaze is not directed towards God at all. It's directed towards their fellow men, those that are the people of God. You know, whenever um, this comes up and, and um, you know, uh, the wicked watch the righteous, we see examples of this in the Bible all the time. Uh, for instance, just think of the focus of Joseph's brethren. Who, who was the subject of their focus? It was Joseph. They, they just couldn't uh, stand him, and, and finally they got rid of him. How about King Saul and his attention? Was, was it upon serving God and, and being a godly king? No, Saul's attention was obsessively fixed upon David, and he sought to slay him again and again. Or what of the presidents and princes in Babylon as uh, the Medes and the Persians conquered it and set up uh, Daniel over them? Well, they watched Daniel so carefully to find fault and error, but they could not, uh, so they had to develop a strategy and devise a plan to entrap him. You see, it. this is the case of the wicked in this world. They don't understand. They're looking in the wrong place. They're looking at the righteous because they know that really deep down that these people, these true believers, do identify with God, that they are God's representatives and his ambassadors or his servants, his messengers. And, and since they, they cannot stand God and they hate the light of the gospel, they hate the light that these individuals carry on behalf of God. And, and so they're, they're watching very closely. Now it gets really muddled and, and confused when uh, the same people are professed Christians. And they're watching other professed Christians with this intent watch, hoping to find a mistake and a fault in order that they can pounce. And uh, I'm sure uh, many of you have listened to the Open Forum program and, and callers over the years. I, I, uh, I know I have, and occasionally you hear someone who listens more carefully than anyone else. And I remember this one man, and he would call, and he would tell Mr. Camping what Mr. Camping had said weeks ago at a particular time, and it would be a quote. And he did this often, listening so closely, and yet for no profit. There's no gain. There, there's no spiritual benefit because he's listening for all the wrong reasons to find fault and in order to slay, really, in a spiritual sense, in a figurative way, the righteous, the, the child of God. It, it's the same today as it's always been. When people, they're deceived this way, they, they can't help themselves, really, because it's uh, just uh, the characteristic of the wicked to watch the righteous this way and seek to slay them. But they realize that uh, it isn't a good explanation for their actions. So they try to, to explain to others when people say, now, why are you so interested in, in what these people are saying? Won't you just leave them alone and focus on your own Bible study and go your own way. And if you believe God is still saving, why don't you just continue to teach that? And, and why be concerned 
what what anyone else is saying. Well, they say, oh, no, no, we we have to watch them and listen and we have to let everyone know what they're teaching wrong uh, in order to protect other people. You see, we have to warn other people. Oh, you now we see they are acting as a watchman, they believe. They're acting as a watchman, but they're all messed up. They're all wrong. The Bible doesn't say get upon your watchtower and watch other uh, individuals. And when you see them erring, then blow the trumpet to warn people. No, we don't think about that. There's always going to be errors in others that are teaching. There's always going to be lies and deceitfulness that individuals are proclaiming. I mean, uh, why would you, why would anyone single out any one group? If you're going to do that, you're going to be constantly blowing the trumpet. Uh, Just look at all the churches, look at all the ministries that are out there. It's all over. Yet, they're not concerned with the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and and the numerous denominations or the Catholic Church or or the Pentecostals. They're they're not concerned with all these others. It, it, you see, their focus, their fixation comes to one group, normally in particular, that closely identifies with the Word of God. Just like Saul wasn't concerned with others in his kingdom, from what we can read, his fixation was upon David and because David closely identified with the Lord and and Saul was worried about David you see there anyone who says well I have to listen and I have to warn people it, it, they they have the whole idea of being a watchman backwards they they don't understand the Bible they don't understand the role of being a watchman at all. It has to do with looking to God, looking to the Word of God to see what He will say, and then proclaiming that and sharing that with others. And and at times that calls for letting people know that the day of judgment is approaching or the day of judgment has come. And now, of course, the task of being a watchman to warn people is no longer the believer's role because that's all finished. And people were to be warned in order that they take warning. That is, go to God that God might possibly have mercy upon them. But again, God has already finished his salvation plan and no one else will be able to take warning in that way. So the the task of blowing the trumpet as a watchman has been completed. Well, uh, let's let's continue here into verse 33 of Psalm 37. Jehovah will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Now, uh, again, this is a continuation of the discussion of the righteous and the wicked as we saw the wicked watches the righteous and seeketh to slay him the him is referring back to the righteous and then in verse 33 jehovah will not leave him again a reference to the righteous in his hand and the word his is speaking of the wicked we we could read this. Jehovah will not leave the righteous in the wicked's hand, nor condemn him, the righteous, when he, the wicked, is judged. You see, it, it, it's helpful to identify what the pronouns are, are referring to or who they're referring to. It, it's probably good to make a little note of that. Uh, it, it's just helpful when reading. Jehovah will not leave him, the righteous, in his hand, that's the wicked, nor condemn him, the righteous, when he is judged, the wicked. 
Now, this is a very interesting verse that the Lord will not uh, leave the righteous in his hand. Now, first of all, the word leave is the same he a translation of the same Hebrew word that was translated twice already in this psalm as forsaken. Back in verse 25, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And that's the word leave. The Jehovah will not forsake him in his hand. Now that also supports the idea that him is referring to the righteous because it is the righteous that is not forsaken. And, and so the, um, the righteous, the true believers, we would think are more particularly in view here than the Lord Jesus. Why would we think that? Well, because it's saying that the righteous will not be condemned and we know that Jesus, the righteous was righteous one, was condemned for the sake of his people as he lived out that tableau. And actually, uh, in, in fact, as he was condemned to die for all the elect from the foundation of the world. And so this does have a particular application to the elect. Jehovah will not leave him in his hand. Now the hand of the wicked, that God will not forsake his people into the hand of the wicked. And the hand in the Bible points to the will. And and we can just be very thankful to the Lord that God has established this principle, first of all, that he would never leave nor forsake us, and that he would not forsake us or leave us in the hand of the wicked or or, uh, be subject to the whims and will of men, that uh, God has no plans of ever doing that. God's people might experience affliction and tribulation and and uh, face difficulties and at times it could be something that wicked men do that that bring these circumstances um, to bear but but it, God ultimately is in control and and he's the one uh, moving in these things to accomplish his purpose for us and all things work together for good for those that love him as he first loved us and so therefore we we know we're not in uh, ultimately in uh, the hands of the wicked we're not uh, under their control they they they're only permitted perhaps to harm us to the degree they are by the will of god not by their will god is allowing it well that's that's one good bit of information now let's Uh, Look at a verse in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, and we'll read this and then think about what God is saying here in, in Psalm 37, 33. It says in Deuteronomy 25, in verse 1, If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Now, uh, in in this place, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, we gain a principle that the judgment of the unsaved cannot be overly much. This is the place, a little uh, further on, I'll read verses 2 and 3, where it says, And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. Here the Lord uh, again lays down the principle that judgment must have a limitation. You cannot beat someone endlessly. And since God follows his own law, that 
teaches us that there cannot legally or biblically be a place called hell where people suffer without end forever and ever. That would go contrary to this law of God. And God does speak of um, meeting out his punishment, his judgment for the sins of men in, in this way of meeting out stripes. We read this uh, in the gospel account in Luke that the Lord speaks of some receive many stripes and some receive fewer stripes. And he's referring to the unsaved as they are receiving his wrath for their sins in the day of judgment. Well, that establishes that Deuteronomy 25 is a passage that can give us information concerning judgment day. And now that's important because, again, in verse 1 here of Deuteronomy 25, if there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment. Now notice that uh, this is a controversy between men. We can understand it as between Cain and Abel or Jacob and Esau, saved and unsaved, righteous and wicked. And they're coming unto judgment. They come unto judgment, both together. And then it goes on that the judges may judge them. Now, again, notice that the judges will judge them, plural, both, not just one, not just the wicked. Then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Now we we understand that both the righteous and the wicked went before the judge to experience the judgment. Both the righteous and the wicked, but the judgment justified the righteous and condemned the wicked. Now that that, that is very significant that God is telling us that because we're living in the day of judgment. We're living at a time when judgment day has come and God's people remain upon the earth. We're still here. He has not raptured anyone as yet. Uh, uh, he'll, that'll come at the very end of the day of judgment. But we have all entered together into the time of judgment and the judges god the father god the son and god the holy spirit will judge between the righteous and the wicked and will make determination well the he, god will justify the righteous and condemn the wicked remember what it said in second corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. And, and here, if you look at the preceding verses, uh, it's speaking of true believers. And um, uh, the reference to we again and again is, is a reference to true believers. We must all appear or be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's exactly what God has done. He has brought all mankind into the day of judgment. And the children of God who have been judged already in Christ from the foundation of the world are appearing a second time but without sin because our sin was paid for by Jesus you know it's it's interesting that as Jesus appeared a second time or experienced the judgment of God a second time when he entered into the human race he was without sin, and yet he was experiencing the cup of God's wrath. 
and and yet he was not making payment for sin at all. And now, true believers, we were judged in him also from the foundation of the world. As all of our sins were paid for, there's no sin that remains to be paid. True believers will not have to be judged at all for that. We, we have been judged, but now... God is using this as an opportunity to make manifest that truth that all of our sins were paid for and therefore he can justify us in the day of judgment. And and Deuteronomy 25 is a proof text that indicates that God's plan is to bring both the wicked and the righteous before him in judgment day in order to justify the people of God and to condemn the rest. And as it says here in Psalm 37, 33, Jehovah will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. At the time the wicked are being judged, the righteous will not be condemned. And that would mean that we were being justified.